Welcome to Digital Asset News, take a top stories in crypto and bring them out of bite-sized pieces. Today, just as the thumbnail suggests, Bitcoin is on a surge, but there's some things we really need to take a look at as far as what to be careful for. So we're going to do a quick market recap. We're going to take a look at uh, four reasons why this could happen and is an ETF that bad? Also, we're going to flip the script a little bit and we're going to talk about the future and we're going to talk about why NFTs and why they're so popular. We're going to talk about how to NFT and how to evaluate these things and everything in between. So before we get into that, let's take a look at uh, the market cap recap real quick. Now, I know that uh, lately we've been doing this uh, a little bit more in depth. I want to try to condense this so we can shorten up the videos. You're busy. I'm busy. So let's just make this uh, work as best as possible. So first things first, uh, market cap. 2.3 trillion, we're up 1%. That's not too bad. Bitcoin price is going bananas. I mean, it's almost, uh, I think it almost hit 58,000. Now we're at 57,360. But there's some things we really should be careful for. We're using Trade the, trade the Chain for sentiment analysis. Uh, the daily sentiments, I mean, pretty good for uh, what's gone up, you know, a good, gosh, 2,000 and like no time, almost 3,000, like no time at all. So, I mean, if we can keep this up, not too bad. Now, the question is though, did all this market cap flow into alts? So we'll take a look at uh, the coins themselves. And in all honesty, in the last 24 hours, no, not really. Everything's gone into Bitcoin. In the seven days, Bitcoin has gone up 16%. Ethereum in a week has only gone up three. Tether, nobody cares. XRP, uh, 8%. Polkadot, 9% up for the week. But for the last 24 hours, not too much that have anything at all, really. It's all pretty much been the king crypto except for phantom hey, pretty good but uh that's exactly what's going on so the real question is is why why is this going on why is it happening right now so let's just take a look at just a little pieces of data and i can just tell you right now here's the uh, the bitcoin on the two hour and uh, i'm not a big ta person but it is interesting to take a look at as far as like the rsi and then where things are going so we can see that uh uh this i guess this morning it's uh uh, in the uh, 12, we could see that uh, it was a pretty big, enormous candle after everything. Let me blow this up so you can see it. So as we came around here, and look at this wick, 55, 50, well, almost 55, 8 right around here. And then all of a sudden, just in a matter of uh, no time, uh, again, two hours, we went from 56 all the way up to 57.5. That's a pretty good uh, price action. Uh, in just uh, two hours, I mean, you can make two thousand bucks. Then, of course, right after that, uh, we're in a green candle, and see how we're just teetering on this RSI, meaning that we're overbought. But it just kind of came down a little bit because of this uh, little pullback, and now here we are at this. Uh, I guess it might be a Doji. Correct me <laughs> in the comment section, but it looks like there's a little indecision right now. But it seems that uh, a little bit of uh, the momentum is fading, and after something like that, I can see exactly why. So. Uh, that's what we have as far as that. But if we take a look at uh, somebody like Plan B, who, you know, where are we going? And this guy's been pretty right uh, for quite some time. I mean, with his stock to flow, it's a little off. I mean, he says right now the stock to flow should be 100K. But based on his analysis, he's saying that this, he's like, look, uh, Bitcoin's below 34. This was actually on June, uh, triggered by Elon Musk Energy FUD. There's more fundamental reasons that we can see weakness in June and possibly July. My worst case scenario for 2021 are this, August 47K. And he hit that. He actually hit that number, worked out pretty well. September, he said September is going to be a mad, bad month. I think everybody knew that or everybody thought that. I've been talking about it forever. And yeah, it was 43K. And then just like we talked about, I've always said Q4 is going to be fireworks. And we see it right now. We see a little bit of a run. And he's saying, hey, October 63K. November is 98K and December is 135K. Again, this is not the stock to flow. He's made this very clear. This is just on his analysis, just his TA uh, and what the data shows. So I'm like, great, I can definitely see that. Again, uh, there's a, a little bit of things to be afraid of. So uh, if we take a look at that. Also, if we take a look at the past past, and we just did this uh, about a week and a half ago or so, it's been just like this. And I like to look at the past to see where we're going. And in 2016, it almost mirrors 2021 again. Uh, we had a dip or a pullback in May, pretty pretty severe for the time. It looks kind of ridiculous now, even though how small it is. And then uh, we had a pullback or dip in July, a uh, dip in September, then it went parabolic. So that was May, July, September, pullbacks or dips. What happened in 2021? Same thing, dip in May, July, September. And then what happened? Well, parabolic. And I think that's kind of where we're going right now. Again, is everything going to go up forever? No. But in the long run, 
I think we're doing okay. But the big thing then is, okay, well, with all these things going on, what's the reason for all this happening? Well, it's a good question. And uh, this was an article. Uh, this was from uh, JP Morgan, their, their brainiacs over there said, you know, this is why we think things are going on. And really, I'll just sum it up like this. Uh, there was really just three reasons that they talked about. Uh, the first one uh, was everything that has to do with uh, clarity. And then we had Jerome Powell and we had uh, Gary Gensler come out and say, hey, we're not going to ban it. So that was one that was huge, I think, to push the narrative. Uh, the second reason was uh, Lightning Network in El Salvador. Things are really picking up over there. And the third reason is inflation. And we see it coming all around. Even Jerome Powell says, hey, we thought it was uh, transitory. <laughs> Guess not. So uh, we have more of that. So people want to hedge and they're not getting into gold. We've talked about this. They're putting into gold 2.0, which is Bitcoin. And the fourth reason comes down to this little thing called an ETF. And the ETF sounds great uh, in theory, but there's some caveats I think everybody needs to be aware of. So first of all, I've been hearing this, this song of dance forever about a Bitcoin ETF coming on and it never has, but now it seems like that might actually come to pass because of all the regulation, all the things that are coming about. Again, I think the SEC and uh, the central bankers, they don't really care so much about crypto so much as CBDCs and stable coins. So here's the story and I want you to keep an open mind about what could potentially happen. And really we're gonna talk about the short term and the long term. So this was a good article, talks about, uh, this was from, uh, Pantera CEO, which is uh, Dan Moorhead, he says, the day before a US Bitcoin ETF launches, I'm gonna take some chips off the table. That's essentially what he's saying. So what he's talking about here is, why would a Bitcoin ETF be so dangerous? And he just says, look, he goes, uh, we heard this song and dance in 2017. I was around at this time. I heard that uh, that a Bitcoin futures was gonna launch by the, by the CME and everybody's super excited, like this is gonna be awesome because now institutional money is here and they're gonna prop it up. Well, guess what happened? Uh, the launch date was December 17, 2017, and that essentially was the top. And this was actually a quote uh, from Moorhead. And he says, all during 2017, the markets were rallying, rallying with the mantra, when the CME lists Bitcoin future, we're going to the moon. The markets did rally 2000 plus percent until the very day the futures was listed. And then we saw Bitcoin winter, right? And then on top of that, we also took a look at uh, some of the big uh, news, which was uh, Coinbase had their uh, direct listing. It became a public company. And that was on April 14th. And what happened on April 14th? Well, before that, we went all the way up from below 20,000, all the way run up to 65,000. It was pretty great, pretty great time. And the Bitcoin price was, you know, 64, 863. And guess what happened as soon as Coinbase launched? Well. Uh, during that time, that was April 14th, if we take a look here, uh, let's see, let's go back. So everything's going good, good, good. This looks like the peak, the peak it's April 12th, 13th, 14th, and then all of a sudden, boom, down it goes. And then up a little bit, and then down, down, down. And we saw this huge pullback. And again, it was all about this great news. We're finally getting adoption. Everything's great. So now here comes along this Bitcoin ETF, which people do believe it's actually going to happen. It's going to happen potentially at the end of this month, early next month. We will see. But uh, they're like, look, if this happens again, um, this could be the start of the negative. And even uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, uh, one of the Bitcoin OGs, the uh, guy has been here from a uh, very long time, says, hey, I'm totally against it. But his reasoning isn't about price. His is about the ecosystem and how it will damage. But um, to finish this all up, and we'll, and we'll get into why it's actually good and bad. Speculators believe a US-based ETF would allow investors from the country to invest and real Bitcoin would be obtained by these funds, making the currency even more scarce. Because with this ETF, as opposed to a futures like CME futures, this is going to be a potential ETF futures as well, but you have to have physical Bitcoin it has to be purchased by somebody. Some institutions have to purchase. They have to hold it. The ETF, you can get into that. You don't have to hold it. And institutional uh, investors could potentially like, uh, you know, big money players could get in. But somebody has to hold Bitcoin. And that means if somebody's holding Bitcoin, that means that no, one's, no one can actually uh, sell it because they have to hold it. So that's actually a good thing. But remember this. Gold and silver ETFs were not helpful to precious metal markets and actually suppressed the price of gold and silver because of 
manipulation. So this past March, three North American Bitcoin ETFs were approved by Canada securities regulators and everything was pretty good. I mean, uh, we've had some pretty good and that was in March and we saw a pretty good run up until April. Hmm, funny timing though, isn't it? So the thing is about this, there's a lot to unpack here, but when you take a look at all the pros and cons and everything else, yes, there's, they're going to have to hold Bitcoin. They're going to have to actually have it in their possession and people are going to be able to buy, buy it up. Can this market be manipulated? Absolutely. Look, the, the market cap of traditional equities stocks is over $100 trillion. So how easy would it be to manipulate this market down and around everything else? Uh, because we're only at $2.3, $2.4 trillion. It's extremely easy. It is extremely easy. So am I worried about this um, a little bit, but only in the short term? Because in the long term, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter whatsoever. But there is some caveats, and that's what I want to talk to you about right now. So with this one, just remember that uh, back in 2017, ICO days, uh, institutions weren't here. They were just goofing around. They just pretty much laughed at us. And now no one's laughing now. Now it's a little bit more serious. And this is uh, the Bitcoin world uh, holdings. And you can see all the different companies, MicroStrategy being one of the big ones. Let me blow this up so you can see it. Uh, Tesla, Galaxy Digital, uh, Voyager, Square, Marathon, Coinbase. And from all these people, and they, got, they own a lot, a lot of Bitcoin. It's only 1.083%. And then you've got countries and governments that own Bitcoin. Uh, Bulgaria says it owns 1%. I don't really believe that. Uh, this was an article... Bulgarian government actually owns $3 billion. This was in 2017. They seized it from some kind of a, a, a legal manufacturer or somebody. Uh, and they probably, I don't know if they still have it still. They probably sold it off. But uh, if they do own it, hey, that's 1%. That's tied up. Great. Don't know if they'll hold it, but who knows. Uh, Ukraine, El Salvador, with all the talk about that, is only 0 0.003. The Georgian government, you know, 1.24%. Okay, maybe. And then you got private companies like Block One, Tezos, Stone Ridge, all of them, another almost percent. And then ETFs, of course, Grayscale, the coin shares, uh, the three IQ, the ones we talk about from the Canada. That's uh, almost four percent. So you add that up, four, three, four, five, six, about six percent. I mean, give or take a percentage uh, somewhere around there. So that is pretty good. So again, this is a lot different than it was back in 2017. Again, they have to hold physical Bitcoin. Yes, they can still manipulate it and things can go a little bit wonky. So the question is, do you want to be one of those people that just uh, trades and bounces around and does whatever? Or you just say, you know what? I know what I got. I think I'm going to hold on to my crypto assets because if they're going to, they're going to do these things, how long can they possibly do it? Now, it could go uh, pretty long, could not, but I don't see that actually happening, especially in this time frame. So for me, uh, not investment opinion, or not investment advice is the best opinion. I'm going to hold on for quite some time because I just don't see if there is manipulation, I could worry about it, or I could just hold and sit back and just pick my spots and have my little exit strategy or do loans or do staking or do DeFi or do whatever else I want to do to create those funds. And it's all up to it's all up to you and what you want to do is what's best. So that's what we have uh, for that article. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. Let's go on to our next piece where we talk about why nfts and this was a it's a pretty good article um but let me backtrack real quick the reason i wanted to transition to this is first of all i, I sent this tweet out a couple days ago and i said at this point does anybody not believe that uh bitcoin is going to be around 100k by the end of the year i mean i mean for everything that we've seen we've got regulatory clarity people are getting out of gold everything we just talked about right there and then an ETF coming about, which again, they got to hold it. So they might manipulate a little bit, but uh, I think they, what they really want to do is they're, they're going to manipulate. They want to manipulate a little bit so, so their clients can get into it, but they've already done that. That, that Wyckoff model uh, has already been, uh, it's already coming out of it. So if we see like that, they've, they've already done the manipulation. They probably want to get it in as low as they can. Then they'll just blast off and that'll, that, that's what it'll be, hopefully. So the question then is, if that's what's happening, what about uh some other things that might be much better returns and that leads me to this point which was this was an article about talent giant creative artist agency banks deal with whale zero x v1 and the question is well who cares who cares about this it's going to make a lot of sense in a bit 
So Zero XB1 partners with Creative Artist Agency to bolster advisory partnership. First of all, who is Creative Artist Agency? Well, that is these guys. Creative Artist, Creative Artist Agency, or CAA, American Talent and Sports Agency based in Los Angeles. Who cares? This is why we care. Creative Artist Agency, Entertainment and Sports Agency, and as of 2007, right now 2021, it had a client's list that included a near monopoly of A-list actors, writers, and directors. You got everything from uh, Dave Bautista, uh, Jessica Chastain, George Clooney, Bloody College, Glenn Close, Tom Cruise, everybody you want to think of. And that's just the A-list Hollywood actors, not just the sports. Oh, here's music. Uh, Barry Gibb. Okay. Oh, Barry Gibb. Green Day, <laughs> Little Wayne, Ludacris, jeez. And then everything else that you want to think about. So when we talk about like they ain't to deal with this guy or this entity or this person, this lady, whoever it is, why? Well, this is why. On Friday, CAA told The Hollywood Reporter that it signed a deal with the OXB and it aims to help monetize their collection of NFTs through licensing and brand partnerships. You see, this guy right here, this person, they bought a ton of super expensive NFTs. They probably weren't that expensive back then. And uh, he's been holding on to them. He just you know, has a nice little uh, Twitter account and just talks about this, I got this, 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 this. And what CAA did is they reach out to me and go, hey, what we want to do is we want to, we want to license that intellectual property in regards to all the NFTs you have. So isn't that interesting? So all these goofy, all these goofy um, pictures that we make fun of and we don't really understand. I mean, some of us do. I'm, 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 trying to, I'm starting to wrap my head around it. All those things that we have, those can now be licensed. So when people take a look at it and they say, well, what is the utility here for an NFT? Well, if you want to use that, if you want to use that in a movie, if you want to use that in a series, if you want to use that in, on uh, newspaper print or whatever else it is, or on the internet, you got to pay somebody something. And that's intellectual property. And with uh, CIA here, since they have, they are big into that arena, they say, hey, we want to use one of these NFTs and we'll pay you X amount. Sure. And for the time that you can do it, he can use it forever. I mean, really, and he can pass it on to his kids if he really wanted to. And then also, you know what's great about that is that every different property of the NFT that he bought, it is legible on the blockchain, and they can prove that this person bought it and they can't really take it away, unless, of course, he sells it, which I think would be a bad idea. So if we take a look at utility, that's a pretty big utility for all those goofy little pictures that we have out there that we're like, what the heck? And, uh, and actually... This is from uh, Crypto Stash, and he's uh, one of the eight or nine people I recommend in my uh, in my comment section or my uh, description. It's like it's uh, it's him and Coin Bureau and Digital Dave and Alex and all those guys. This is the thing about Stash, and he says it, and it's pretty pretty smart. He goes, "If you think NFTs are a fad, which I did, uh, wait till they hit mainstream gaming. The concept of owning your skins, guns, characters instead of renting them from the game makers is every gamer's dream." And then somebody writes in, they go, hey, Stash, he says that, hey, Stash is a bot. He posts the same tweets every few weeks because he can't come up with anything original. And I said, you know what? Uh, my, my response was this. It was, uh, it's a good thing he has a bot or someone else that tweets out because people like me, uh, they need to see this because they didn't see the first one or the fifth one or the 20th one or whatever else it is. So that yeah, makes sense to me. So yeah, so we have that little piece right there. It makes a lot of sense. And then I said this, I'm go. I said, hey, this was yesterday. I said, I'm going to feature NFT projects on my channel uh, coming up, but here's the criteria. Because I feel like just like we can evaluate cryptocurrencies and digital assets, we can take a look at, you know, who's the team behind it? Uh, what is the utility? Uh, what is the community like? You know, all the, all the good stuff. What are the tokenomics? What does it do? We can take some of that and we can start to evaluate non-fungible tokens or NFTs and say, okay, well, this is my criteria. I felt like this is a very good uh, start. First of all, I, I said, just name out your uh, NFT project that has utility, additional minting, launchpad, rewards, gamification. Uh, talk to me about the community. If they have uh, a thousand or more, that's, a, that's the minimum uh, that they have to have on Discord. Uh, if they have more than 10K, that's good. And more than 25K, uh, 25,000 people, that's great. The community drives everything because it gets people talking they branch out, more people buy, more people get into it, makes sense. And also, I said, the last criteria is this. The floor price has got to be less than 0.2 ETH or is about to launch soon. Because, I mean, in reality, we could, let me bring this up. We could, we could go to OpenSea and we could say, like, the, the very top one, the floor price is, geez, 7 ETH for this one. 
right? And it hasn't really even, I don't think it's really launched that much or it's just about to begin. Crypto Toad, 7.3. The Humanoids, which I probably will buy, it's uh, 0 0.7. That's the base floor price. And then 7, 1.2, 0 0.28 for the official surreals. Okay, so we can do all those things, but, and maybe like like the Doge Pound and Cyber Kong and all things, maybe that's going to be worth, I don't know, 100 ETH in the future. I have no idea. But the goal is, is to get in on the ground floor. And I think the best thing to do is try to look at a little bit back and uh, see which ones are launching. And 0 0.2 ETH, I, I, I think for a lot of people won't break them. So I kind of look at it like this. When I'm thinking about investing into NFTs, this is how I see for me. I'm not saying for you, but I feel like I've got my holding portfolio and that's like 90, 94%, somewhere around there. I'm not going to touch it. I'm just going to buy and hold and I'm going to do like I talked about. I'm going to have my exit strategy go from there. What else? I'm going to trade a little bit, maybe two or 3%, maybe 4%. And then the gambling, which could be NFTs, could be like one to 2%, right? And in this situation, I'm not breaking the bank by going, you know what? 100% in NFTs. I'm going to go all in on, um, you know, tomato blasters or whatever, something stupid. And, and you lose all your money. That makes no sense, right? That's why I call it gambling because... On this one, NFTs, there's a lot of products out there, but I can see where things could go pretty well. So um, that's where I see things going. And again, also on NFTs, this is all Ethereum based on OpenSea. And of course, I mean, you can do some things and, and, and uh, you know, mint it through, through Matic and stuff like that. It's not as expensive, but it's still pretty damn expensive. I bought an NFT yesterday and uh, it was about a, about 100 bucks. Okay. And to mint it, it was like 90 bucks. And I'm just telling you, I'm like, geez, I mean, it's almost the same thing. So, I mean, if I'm going to buy a Cyber Kongs, right, for 10 ETH, I don't really care about a $100 gas fee, right? But I'm not, I'm just a normal person. So I don't have that much uh, just to kind of gamble on that. So when I take a look at it, is, well, what's the next thing? So I can take a look at, uh, not Mechaverse, um, not Cyber Kongs. Look at something like this. Like this is Solon Art. So just Solana, it's where you can, it's solanart.io, I'll link in the description. And you can find a lot of good um, projects that are being launched on Solana. Look at this global market cap, uh, seven day volume. Some of these, let's see, Solana is about 150 right now. So you're looking at, that's still pretty pricey for some of these. Well, 20, and you're looking at, that's like three, three grand, so on and so forth. So yeah, that's, that's not... That's pretty high on some of these things, but you can always look around. Again, what's the utility and so on and so forth. But, and then to mint these, it's, I mean, it's not that, not that expensive. Also, I just bought a, um, an NFT on Cardano. And as opposed to OpenSea, where I'm going to spend 90 bucks per every single NFT, on this one, it was a fraction of a Cardano. So on these things, I mean, I can understand where, things are going. I don't know what's going to happen in the future as far as NFTs, but I can just tell you like this. If I'm looking to get into something, I want to get into something at the very base, lower floor, and then kind of build up from there. If I screw up and I just say, ah, that one didn't work out. I thought I did, I did my homework and utility was there and community was there and it was less than that, but it just didn't work out. It didn't work out. But if I spread things around, it might work out. Again, this is just my gambling portfolio. And that's, uh, that's what it is. So look, I know that was a lot, but I'm excited about where the space is headed. And I can kind of, I can definitely see now how NFTs, most of them, not most of them, some of them actually have utility just for the story that we saw about uh, copyright, intellectual property. Uh, you can mint on these things. You can uh, have a launch pad. You can gamification, all that good stuff. And that's all out there. And I think this is, if you want to really give it a name, it's ICO 2.0. That's really what it is. It's that risky. But that's it. So look, if you stuck with me all the way in, thanks. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you like today's show, give it a thumbs up. That would be great. Also consider subscribing. A lot of things we talk about are very time sensitive. And that's all for today. So thanks so much. I appreciate it. See you in the next one.